right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Monitor Keeping Podcast. I'm Alan here with Kai and the guest today. Um, before we get to our guest, Claire, just wanted to give a quick shout out to the Morelia Python Radio Network. Uh, thank you again for having us in the uh, in the um, under the umbrella. Uh, with everything going on and for those of you that are new to the show or have been following even uh, for a little bit uh, if you haven't done it yet go on to the morelia python radio.com website check them out see what they have to offer there's uh, several different podcasts on there all covering great information some of them are more species related um or <clears throat> such as the um carpet pythons carpet and cop uh carpets and coffee uh, and then, of course, Morelia Python Radio. Uh, we're doing monitors, and there's a few other ones out there that are pretty cool. So check them out. Check out their Patreon. And, again, thank you, Eric, for uh, helping us out, allowing us to do this, and tapping into your experience. All right. Kai, how you doing? Hey, not too bad. Not too bad. Um, really just, uh, you know, my monitors won't let up. So there's, there's not really out of the swing. I'm just kind of continuing the swing. So you know, they still got a lot going on with a um, fair amount of breeding, laying, watching females, stressing over the whole entire situation as well. And yep. then, um, yeah, so, you know, uh, everything's been pretty smooth so far, though. Like I didn't haven't had any females give me any scares after laying. Everything has been pretty smooth so far. So I'm just going to keep keep to my uh, my normal regimen of things. And um, yeah. Uh, from there from there i'm not really going to change too much right now i think if uh, they keep on breeding and having like you know six or seven excessive clutches uh, i may slow them down a little bit more but right now they seem to be rocking so yeah. you know, i'm just gonna keep on going with that um you know i wanted to uh before we got into the actual podcast i wanted to introduce a little section which is kind of like a highlight reel or like a highlight section where we're just um exactly that or just uh putting some of the events that have been happening within the united states or even around the world monitor related wise um and this is just uh you know to put some things in their own in their own bright light give them their little shine real quick and you know for uh, for myself uh, i've just been still been able to um you know move slowly progressively with my kai island um type of monitors uh varanus coli is what they're called and uh, I've, you know, been able to work with Kimberly's and um, get some decent eggs out of those. Not really successfully hatched too many, but we're slowly moving in the process. Um, you know, uh, Alan himself has hatched out uh, some Flavies yeah. for as, as much as what the United States has for Flavies. They're the really nice quality looking animals. Um, uh, congrats, man. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, um, I think recently we had... Uh, uh, Linnea here with uh, the Savannah monitors, and she's going through the, the baby, um, the baby terrors right now. So, you know, getting, <laughs> getting all 36, 40 babies to, um, to eat well, and you know, it's a task. So, even breeding might seem great; it's like it's a it's an awesome achievement. But to take care of those babies, that's a whole nother feat. Yeah. And um, yeah, to do it the right way, make sure they grow up well, um, and all that stuff. So, uh, and uh, Another thing, and I guess this one I kind of saved for last, um, Tom Crutchfield's Parthenogenic Salvadori. That yeah. the um, highlight for the last 10, 20 years even. So, I mean, other things have been great. You know, I think Spencer and I have been hatched out, uh, a few other species. I think mm, a couple of us working with mangroves here, uh, Melanist and things like that. But croc wanderers i mean <clears throat> sure it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't bread sure that's that's you know that's fine um but still hatched out parthenogenically that's amazing yeah. so congrats to uh the crutchfield family over there um and uh man i mean you know and the, any of the other guys that i might miss just because you know i, I might not really be uh, a lot of a lot of things are, are scanning through my brain right now, but there's a ton of guys that have great success this year so far, and it's been a good year. Or just moving progressively, even if they're not getting eggs, and you know things are just moving. They're not hatching out babies, but they're getting eggs, or or they're breeding, and you know things are moving just past the stage of just the like myself. I have some aggressive animals that won't do anything. So 
<laughs> yeah. Um, now, getting into uh, the podcast today, uh, one of those species that is kind of uh, adored by many keepers in the hobby um, is uh, Varanus. I, I believe it's, I'm pronouncing it right, it's a Ruticolis. Ruticolis, Ruticolis. yeah. Yeah, and so, um, um, and then that's the black roughneck monitor lizard. Um, now these guys are probably one of the most, I'd say, prehistoric looking as far mm -hmm. as just build their beak. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a snout, but it looks like a beak. You know, <laughs> there are their ridges and everything like that. And so, um, for me, I've never really kept them. I have experience and kind of worked with them a little bit, but I haven't really, you know have them at long ever it's mostly just an animal that was landed at my feet and i either sold it or a friend had it and i only worked with it really briefly um yeah. but they're pretty docile they're not like they're not too cantankerous or i'm used to like really nasty guys that are pooping and biting and turning around <laughs> you know at, at the very side of you but i've had pretty decent experiences with um rudy's myself um and so uh, we've brought on Claire today to talk about these, uh, her, 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 her experience with these, these awesome lizards. Um, and hey, Claire, are you there? Yeah. yeah so right. I have been keeping roughnecks since August of 2019. I got my first one, actually my first reptile, which was not the most uh, best idea, but I successfully keep, kept her. So I'm really proud about that. Um, but I got her when I was 15 and now I'm 17 and she's around three years old and I got her off of Craigslist. Somebody was keeping her. She was about 30 inches long and she was actually being kept in a 36 by 18 by 36 exoterra with like this dinky little reptifogger and mercury <laughs> vapor bolt. And I was just like, oh, well, I'm glad I'm getting you out of that situation. You know, they're they're not they're not expensive. So they were only, she was only like 250 bucks and they got her from uh triple L uh, reptiles yeah. over by where I live. And they just were, they were like, well, I'm going off to college and I need her out of here. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, that's how a lot I, of, them, that's how a lot of people end up with their monitors actually. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Uh, yeah, they end up getting too big for somebody or the situation changes for, the people and the animal and yeah they have to get rehoused mm -hmm. but yeah keep going yeah but um basically i really just started off by being like interested in your normal iguanas and boas and whatnot in early 2019 when i was back in ninth grade i think wow. and so it you're was really, like you're actually pretty young with <laughs> keeping varanids and you know like not or to be honest not a lot of not a lot of young people can do it i mean right. it's just uh it's a financial thing. It's a space thing. You don't have your own space. You have just a room, you know, or things like that. So, um, you know, the young people, like for myself, anything bigger than a four by four or like uh, maybe even a five foot cage, that was, that was it. That's all I can really support. But, you know, so if anything grew into that and then outgrew that cage, they were getting sold and then I would replace it with a little one. That's what I would be doing as a young kid, you know. Um, mm -hmm. something like that yeah yeah but like you know i started off doing your basic research i'm on instagram and i like to look through all the reptiles on there and i saw black dragon and i'm like oh my god that's so cool like i'm kind of interested in it and i'm the type <laughs> of person who <laughs> likes to go out and research like so much and have all of these notes and it like it was something for me to hang on to and i was really excited um then i found black dragons were you know three four five six thousand dollars and i'm like uh that's not really in my budget nor is the <laughs> amount of space that i would need um yeah. but like i did a little bit of digging and you know i came across the black tree monitors i have a thing for black black animals i don't know why but um you know, yeah, I come across, look. huh? It's like the majestic look. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, I, I looked at dumarils, I looked at mangroves, I looked at peach throws, I compared and contrast everything. But then eventually I was like, roughnecks are like really cool. And I found Facebook 
And I was like, you know, does anyone keep Roughnecks here? And I was diverted to the Roughneck Monitor keeping page on Facebook. And I was like, oh my gosh, this wealth of information. And I'm guessing that you guys probably know Guy Marsters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you don't know, if you're in the reptile community and you don't know who Guy is, <laughs> man, I don't know. You're probably living <laughs> underneath a rock. Guy's kind of everywhere. Or, yeah. You know, um, with the Roughnecks, he's uh, he's what you call uh, past addicted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I I can definitely tell. I think he has. I want to say nine of them now, which oh. I probably say is the largest collection in the U.S. Unless somebody has you know captive born babies that they just yeah. got in, but um. You know, I, I started talking with him and he was giving me all this information and he asked, you know, have you ever kept reptiles before? And I said, uh, no. And he's like, are you sure that you want to go for a roughneck? You know, that's not the most, you know how guy is. He kind of, yeah. he doesn't really want you to get a roughneck unless you're, you have experience, which I totally understand now, um, you know almost two three years i guess two years into keeping and it's just like it's a lot of information and i'm like oh my gosh um but he was really helpful and he tried to kind of you know sway me in the right direction and i gratefully i was i was able to be like oh i shouldn't get my my information from a pet store you know i shouldn't be getting it from some random rep reptile website online because that's just not where i should be going but um, I was able to ask a couple keepers on there and they were just so helpful with information and I kind of just made notes and then looked at um, how people kept their animals differently and then made my own care guide, but like without any experience, just collecting notes from people. And I found that's like one of the best strategies to fully understand a species before even getting one. And it just, it really helps you out to be able to prepare yourself, but you're never going to be able to fully prepare yourself, especially when you're getting into monitors. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's always, there's always new Very things true. that you're learning every day. Yeah. There's um, a little guideline, but there's so many little, I, I, I uh, I call them little wrenches now because they're basically <laughs> things that are uh, throwing you off track a little bit. And so, um, uh, I mean, I guess getting into getting into keeping them, how how uh, how did you start? Like, what when you got that little guy? How big of an enclosure did you put him in? So I started. I have my room is very small. It's like a ten by ten by eight. So my bed is about three feet across from the entire lizard cage and she's in a um my female is in a 72 by 36 by 72 inch enclosure which frankly isn't big enough for her but it's what i thought was okay at the time and i'm looking to upgrade to more of something that's like a six by four by five or like an eight by three by five which is kind of what i generally generally recommend for roughnecks um, and I kind of just base that off of, you know, what the common standards are for a various uh, species. And also, I actually looked on the Swedish um, minimums for reptiles in their country. And I was like, oh, this actually makes a lot of sense. I'm going to kind of base my, my stuff off that. But, um, you know, I set it up with pretty minimalistic things. And, you know, it's not the most ideal, but it, it had uh, a wooden board that kind of um, was with like par 38 70 watt halogen bulbs which is by far the best way to heat your enclosure like i have not found anything better than that for like daytime uh heating and basking spots because it does provide uva um and it just it gets your basking spot what you need <laughs> yeah, um yeah. a lot of us use those here um, the par 38s in different variations are 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 still the number one go-to bulb yeah mm -hmm. yeah but um you know my enclosure has been able to change over a period of time i found out some mistakes like uh i probably should have a way to keep humidity better because spraying it three times a day especially when i'm at school i had to actually ask my mom hey could you uh spray my enclosure for me <laughs> yeah. um and it, it was it was a beast trying to keep those that humidity up and right now 
I'm keeping around 70 to 80% near the basking spots and on average like 80 to 93% humidity, which is like a lot to handle what it would seem. However, I use like a four and a half liter humidifier that I connected to a pool pump and it just, it flows so well and it lasts like two days. And then all I have to do is refill it with um, like uh, distilled water. Um, But one of the things that I actually found about that is that um, you actually need a computer fan to circulate that um, because actually I had uh, another humidifier and it got so condensed over a period of time. And I didn't know this um, because this was in uh, like a year back maybe. And my roughneck actually got um, a respiratory infection and I'm glad that I caught it early, but it's just like uh, I didn't have any circulation and it was just all condensing humidity and I had to give her antibiotic treatments like with um, an injection which was frankly easier than it would seem which is amazing but um because she just she's really chill um but now I've got some cork bark in there and I've got uh, some Bluetooth thermometers and hygrometers and I also Mm -hmm. added um UV which is like totally drastically improved her activity levels as well as her feeding response. And I mean, it, it monitor feeding responses are off the charts, com, charts compared to other species. I mean, we've, yeah. we've all probably oh, yeah. seen this. <laughs> yeah. um, but she, you know, she just totally almost became a new animal. And I was really happy to see that from her and see her, um, you know, utilizing her various basket spots because I actually offer like three different spots in the enclosures that she can go. One of her favorites is like a 130 Fahrenheit basket spot, which is kind of interesting because the what I normally recommend is like 140. Um, but she prefers that and she has the ability to go higher, like around 140, 150. But she just you know, she'll only do that when she's eating a big meal or in the mornings when she's just trying to warm herself up. Um, so what, what what did you go with for as far as UVB lamp? I know uh, um, I see you kind of asking just uh, through the normal channels of what other people's experiences are. Uh, what did you end up going with as far as UVB? Because uh, in, in your search, um, I found, you know, results myself or other recommendations really um so i haven't mm-hmm. bought all of them yet i've only bought a couple but what did you go with so by far the best source of uv is arcadia brand like i know that people use um i think it's Zoomed or something like that or repti sun and those just the other ones either they don't last as long or they're kind of a 50 50 on whether it'll last long or not I've had this bulb for a long while and it's still strong standing. Um, You know, I'd like to invest in a solar meter at one point because then it will make it so then I don't have to replace it as often. But a lot of the people who I've talked with, they have bulbs that still read um, the same UV levels after a year, which is amazing. Um, But for the roughnecks, you want it around, uh, I have a 12%. Uh, UV and it's right by her basking spots. Um, You know, it's uh, right between her bulbs. So then she gets that UV and she gets the UVA from the halogens. A compact one or you're using the the tube one? So actually the tube ones are the best ones for larger animals. You only really want to use the compact ones in smaller enclosures like, you know, a crested gecko enclosure or something like that because you actually have a very high percentage UV in the um, in a certain area, and then like very low amounts in the surrounding areas. But the linears seem to produce the best UV for long periods of time. Um, right. And for most of those, you know, Southeast Asian species, you don't need high, per- you don't need a lot of percentage. Like you don't need the 14% that maybe a bearded dragon would need. The 12% works just fine for like 18 inch away basking spots. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that that would work for uh, the roughnecks and dumerils and peach throats and mangroves and whatnot. I was thinking about going with the seven. 
I was thinking about the going seven. with the seven percent. Yeah, because my cages aren't really that tall. Most of the basking mm -hmm. spots are about twelve inches away, give or take. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the I think the seven would be a little bit better. Some of them are even closer because I use like BR thirties and BR forties rather than par thirty eights, and mm -hmm. the closures are quite short. And so, I still want to use uv without having it too close though so i might get the seven percent that are yeah that are studio bulbs uh, my friend uh, matt recommended me to use to use those as well he just got him some himself so i might actually get into that mm -hmm. you know the, oh sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say when i first got into monitors i found a lot of people saying you know monitors don't need uv they don't benefit from it and it's just a waste of money and i heard that from a staggering amount of people and i started to kind of be interested in maybe how uv actually affects our animals and i was headed hesitant to use it at first because i was like yeah it's just a waste of money but i actually was like, you know what, I'll just, I'll just buy it and see for myself what it can do. And it just, I was like amazed at what it, at what results I got from my animal. And honestly, I always recommend it for any monitor keepers now yeah. because Same. it's just so much of this information and people just say, nope, it's not needed, but husbandry is changing. Right. I've had some, uh, adjustments as well getting into uv and trying to figure out the right one and um for me myself uh I'm, i kind of kind of explained this before but i've had some animals that didn't really do well after laying and then when i put them in underneath the sun in uv they basically bounce back but in their enclosure they didn't have uv there um but then now they do so and then what i went with was uh i went with a mega ray um, just mm -hmm. so I could use the 70 watt without any other bulbs and they're small lizards that I use them mostly in. So, um, they're right. like foot long, two foot long lizards. And so they're small. Um, but yeah, the mega ray is what I went with. Uh, I do believe that they have to have to have some space though, between the bulb and, and the actual basking site. So I have it roughly about 10 or 12 inches away, give or take. It's not mm -hmm. as close as my basking, as my like floodlights would be. Right. Um, yeah. And as Kai knows, honestly, I'm one of those that still rarely uses UV for my animals. Yeah, but it's because uh, people are still being able to breed them and still being able to do everything without, yeah. without it. So that's where the argument still stands strong for non-usage of UVB, and that's where we'll leave it because you know, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of two sides. Oh, yes, yeah. it's, kind of, it's kind of two sides, and I don't know. Some people really just have to get get it going for themselves or experience it themselves. But um, right for me, I've changed. I've changed because you know, if let's say if if my animals are doing crummy, right, which they were, um, and then I just held my pride and said, no, 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 no UVB, because you know other people are doing it. But then let's say if I did, if I you know went ahead and held my ground and didn't try, my animals would be dead. But I went mm -hmm. ahead and, you know, um, upgraded their enclosure, upgraded their UV within the enclosure. And then now I also send them regularly in and out of nesting and they're breeding quite often. So I want to make sure that I'm supporting them as much as I can. So that's where my argument for UVB stands. Um, I just I, I have some benefits with it, but I still have animals right now that are laying without UVB as well. So, you know, you know what's not, funny is I have uh maybe this is backwards honestly for my collection but um i would say my australian stuff i don't i don't have any that i can think of right now but my indo stuff has uvb and i don't know if that was into i i don't remember making that intentional i just think i took a light fixture system and i was like okay you on here you on here um eh, i'll pay attention to it so. yes <laughs> so as far as your uv and your roughneck uh, at one point, I had like UV on the other side of the enclosure, right? Not even on the basking spot. What I wanted mm -hmm. to only do was just light up that other side, right? Right. And so I wanted to basically complement that side with some UV. Um, and I would notice them in the morning rather than going to the basking lamps, with, which they were already used to for months or however long they were in that enclosure, would mm -hmm. actually rather than go and bask underneath the UV bulb. 
So, um, you know, I, I, I basically witnessed, what did you witness? Cause you said that you noticed, you know, a little bit better in feeding response. Um, was there anything more like, I would say you would find acute in with, with your, with the UV in your animal or, um, well, basically I, I had done some research on it and I never put UV in another space because um, you know, I have a four foot UV and it would go over the basking spots anyways. Um, right. I noticed her frequently going up and sitting under the UV. And then she also actually likes to sit right under the um, stream of humidity that's coming down from the humidifier. And she really likes to be right there. And right now that's around 83 um, Fahrenheit and 93% humidity. Um, and she's actually sitting up there right now. And um, one of the other things that I, I failed to mention that her personality, like, even though it's, it's kind of hard to say because you shouldn't personalize or anthropomorphize animals because, you know, especially with monitors, because they're not, they don't really care a whole bunch, but sometimes you can see that, um, that human version that you think is personality shines through. And that makes me really happy. Um, and she right. kind of was more interested and alert to me and wanting to, you know, explore, maybe climb up my pant leg and then sit on top of my shoulder for a little bit. Sometimes we'll even go out down to the mailbox and then pick out, you know, my mail and then she just walks back with me. Um, and that's when I, like when I added UV and before that she wasn't very interested in being around me or kind of exploring more. She was just, she was content with the spots that she already knew she liked and she didn't go anywhere else. And now I let her free roam around the house for around 30 minutes to an hour. And she just kind of roams around everywhere and she enjoys it. And she scares away the cats, of course. Um, <laughs> nice. But, you know, that's mainly the, the aspect that I noticed was the increased activity, alertness, and feeding response. And those are all important things with monitors and especially reptiles just in general just because you know that's a good sign that they're thriving in captivity if you you want to say the word thriving yeah. well we definitely see that it's like you know you see them do really well or respond well or they're not like they're not they're less of jerks yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um now as far as your your feeding response what was your normal diet back then and then has it changed much now in what you do? Um, you know, coming from like a really a stepping into the game and you're really fresh, mm -hmm. fresh into the game. So, you know, you're not really getting like advice where most people would normally just go to the pet store and do that stuff, you know, where that they're just at the mercy of the pet stores where sometimes being an advanced keeper, you're not even really doing that. You're doing everything at Home Depot, going to the supermarket and getting everything just at the store, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what has right. changed for you when you first got it and what it's like now? So when I first got her, I was under the impression that a mice only diet was um, okay. And for roughnecks, they actually, from my research that I've done, they actually have a very varied diet and mostly it's insects. You know, you, you have um, grasshoppers, beetles, cockroaches, um, and even spiders, uh, frogs, uh, what else was yeah. it? Oh, giant so sick insects, <laughs> which is vertebrates yeah. and small invert or big invertebrates and small vertebrates. Yeah. Um, there's, there was some information that somebody said that they witnessed a roughneck eating bird eggs in captivity, not in captivity, um, in the wild. And that was really interesting, but there wasn't any proof to show of that so that's kind of a um you know a thing to just keep in mind yeah. uh but for me personally you know for the first couple of months of keeping her i used a mainly mouse diet and she was like relatively thicker because her previous owner was actually feeding her two mice a day um, live mice, mind you. Um, amazingly, she had no injuries from mice, which was like, huh. Um, but 
I use frozen and she was originally when I first brought her home, she had issues eating. Uh, I, I think it was just due to my uh, lack of wanting to let her acclimate in her enclosures because as a new keeper, I was so ecstatic to have, you know, this prehistoric animal living right, right in front of me. And I just wanted to take her out and play with her and whatnot. But um, Guy would always say, you know, don't do that, Claire. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't right. listen and I kind of paid the price for that. And, you know, now I would say, leave them alone for like a week or two or even a month, depending on what their situation is, you know, just checking on temps and um, feeding them routinely and checking, like changing their water. But that's really about it. And she didn't eat for, I think, a week and a half or two. Just adjusting. Just yeah. adjusting. Yeah. So that was one of the issues that I encountered. And then once she, we actually took her to the vet because um, it was getting relatively concerning and they were like, oh, she's dehydrated. So then they had her hydrated and I do not know if it was the hydration or if it was just the fact that I use an egg, but um, I fed her an egg that night and she went absolutely bonkers for it and she loved it. Yeah, um, the, that egg trick, uh, very, uh, very, very reliable. <laughs> um, I, I use it for everything. I use it for little babies that are hard to get started. I use it for females that are picky, um, bouncing back. I use it, yeah, I use it for a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it's just, it's just a good trigger, like the yolk on the food item when they lick it. Uh, it's Yeah, or also I cut up stuff where it's bloody and it kind of just, there's blood and guts everywhere. They also are very triggered to that too. Right. Um, and, you know, after that couple of months using mice, I kind of did some more research um, into their natural diet. And I used, you know, Google Scholar to find research papers and my God, that was an eye opener to just understand, you know, this is what they're eating in the wild. And here are the resources that I have in captivity. And right now I'm doing a main, mainly um, every day I actually give her crickets. And sometimes when I have dubia roaches, I'll give her that too. And she loves it. And I actually use a enrichment feeder. So I took a soda bottle and I drilled holes in it and then I fill it with crickets and then she chases it around my room and knocking <laughs> the crickets out. I like um, it. I like it. That's cool. Yeah. And you know, she gets she gets a lot of enrichment from that and she it keeps her occupied for a couple minutes and it just you know it makes me excited to see her running around. Um but like for her main diet, uh every other day I don't have a schedule necessarily, but I still have like almost a quota on what I probably should have for um, that week. So, you know, one week I'll maybe, maybe, maybe do um, like three ounces of salmon, uh, three ounces of shrimp, and then a, my, a mouse or a an egg. So then I kind of mix in a various um, amount of prey in that week. And then the next week I'll maybe do, instead of a, um, a mouse, I'll do an egg. So it kind of rotates around that. And I try to limit the amount of rodents in her diet because that's not naturally what she would have, um, in the wild. And also it's been kind of linked to, um, issues with obesity, fatty liver disease, um, and even just an overload of fur in their system, which is something that Guy had said to me that he thinks that one of his um, roughnecks passed away from was actually um, too much rodent fur in her diet, I think, or his diet. I don't remember exactly, but, um, you know, I kind of just want to keep it to a limit. And right now, the, the way that I kind of gauge her um, her size in terms of how much I should be feeding her are by her lateral folds, like the extra um, skin that's kind of on the sides of um, their body. And that kind of just tells me where she's at. If she's kind of looking skinny, then I'll give her a little bit more fat in her diet. If she's looking a little bit thicker, then I kind of check her for eggs just to make sure that there's anything that maybe is making her 
bigger. Um, but usually it's just um, her getting a little bit too much uh, fat or something in her diet, and then I kind of reduce it. So it's just kind of a constant state of, you know, going back and forth to different methods. And I've kind of figured out what works best for her, but um, every animal is different. So you just have to really figure out what works best for your animal. Now, Claire, you mentioned that was her case. Do you have more than the one roughneck? No, I, right now I'm limited because my parents have said a two animal minimum, I mean, maximum rule, because I have a okay. reticulated python right now and <laughs> I have her. <laughs> um, so you're going to get big animals for this. <laughs> yeah, actually. Might as well my, fill in all the space. <laughs> my, my retic is not big whatsoever, even though he's a mainland um, retic, he's like, five feet long and he's like two or three years old i think i think he's three so he's not big at all are you um, just controlling that kind of through feeding for your purposes like a more uh... um kind of i mean i kind of prefer a slow grow especially for retics because they are known to get that um easily obese nature sometimes and especially we yeah. see a lot on instagram and facebook with all of these obese retics and it just like i'm like i don't want my animal ending up like that but it could also right. be due to the fact that he had um oh, i forgot what it it was but it's he coccidia that, he had coccidia yeah and he mm. also has that strange bump on his head i i don't know but um anyways back to roughnecks <laughs> yeah. uh you know i I don't keep a schedule for her feeding and I just go whatever works for her in that moment. And that's one of the big things yeah, with that's monitors. A, it's that's, like, that's what we do too. Yeah. I mean, cause people ask us all the time, like, uh, how much do you feed a day? Uh, how much do you feed a week? <laughs> or, or, you know, there's a, there's a different and extensive answer for right. every little lizard. I mean, if it's, like a, if it's a little baby, I'm going to try to feed it maybe a few times a week you know, uh, three or four times a week, give or take, maybe you know, a tad bit more, but roughly right around there. I give them a day to digest, a couple of days to digest in between all those meals. So it's not right. just like pounding them and pounding them and pounding them and making sure they're, they're fat and chubby because that just leads to problems later on. Um, right. So I kind of keep them lean. And then also at the same time, when they're hungry a little bit, it makes them chase after the stuff. So I get to tongue <laughs> and bond with it. Um, and then like adults, you know, or even sub adults, you know, sub adults or stuff like that, they'll eat a little bit more, but let's go into like females. I mean, I just, I feed, I feed her a lot more. Um, did you notice your girl? Cause you said, uh, she sometimes, um, ends up gravid, right? And she's dropped eggs for you before, right? She's interestingly, uh, she's dropped a singular egg in all of the time that I've had her. Well, and I think yes just a single egg and i and i had taken her to the vet and they're like nope there's no eggs in her and i'm like okay that's a little bit weird mm. um she dropped a calcified egg i think that's what the term is for it um yeah. in my living room when she was uh freely walking so that was an interesting surprise to see <laughs> um <laughs> yeah i bet it was all of a sudden uh, what's that it's like, yeah uh, it's like a I don't know. You get a you get blessed that day. It's like, all right, I figured out your sex. We get this yeah. egg, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I would say roughnecks are one of those species um, that are hard, you know, and hard to sex, hard to keep alive really well, especially when they're imports and they come in all bad. You know, most of the time people don't care for them because they're all dark and stuff like that, and they ended up, you know, they, they ended up they end up getting rid of them or something. Right. But yeah, the, the roughnecks are also very hard to breed. Um, many people that are, <laughs> there are, are quite a few people trying. I think I know of a small handful myself that have, you know, pairs and um, getting getting a little bit, you know, as far as the next progressive step, getting eggs. So hopefully they'll get the, the ticket right again and then get some fertile stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but this species has been known to be quite difficult and I would say hard to rear up correctly where they're they're thriving. You know, surviving is one thing and doing well and interacting is cool, but breeding in captivity, that's the, the real like behind your thriving part. Like that's 
a necessity. And um, getting yours to lay, you know, really gives uh, – uh, you have, a, I guess, a, a golden goose right at your feet, right? And so I would say um, if you were to ever connect a good male with her in and around the season when you're really preparing her and stuff like that, um, mm -hmm. maybe you can get some things going because that's what – you know, when I look at my animals, I try to not just think, oh, you know, you're just going to be a breeding project. I try to actually now consider them, you know, everybody's a little pet and I kind of have to care for you a good amount, get get to know you, essentially be consistent with it. And then, um, you know, they typically breed, right? It's like kind of like you just take care of them really well. And they do it for you, you know, and um, that's what your animal is essentially doing as well, where I think I think for being someone that's only been doing this since 2019, um, you know, doing a cage and staying consistent. Okay. Now most people are just going to sell the roughneck after a few months of getting it. it, it outgrows a four by two and, you know, but you're kind of sacrificing your space and putting a huge enclosure and, you know, really realizing, and also, you know, kind of admitting that even if your enclosure is huge already, it's just still not enough, you know? Um, yeah. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, I have seen so many roughnecks go through Facebook and they just say, you know, what do I do? I just got this animal and it looks cool at a pet store. And that's one of the mm -hmm. big things that I just, I cannot, like, I understand the appeal of such an interesting animal, but in the end, you just get an animal and then you're like, well, now I'm, it's here. What do I do now? And that's one of the big things, and it it's it's a lot of I don't know how to say it. It's like I I get very emotional about stuff like that because I know the I've looked at the import process of these animals, and it is not pretty. Um, you know, there's around fifty percent. I think it was like fifty four percent of roughnecks that come um, that are exported from uh, Indonesia to the States die in transport, which yeah. is just, it, it's yep, very it's sad. It's a really gruesome process. Uh, sometimes they're just sitting on that tarmac or sitting on the deck waiting to be picked up. Um, yeah. who knows rain or shine takes, uh, takes, it's not a day, not a couple day process to travel here on a boat. You know, they're rarely yeah. ever flown, flown over here. They're taking well, every so on a boat. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they're from to describe this to anybody, and uh, this is probably a good, good, good time to really. This is a sad part, but this is the truth behind our business and the truth behind our industry and the hobby. Even though we have the greatest intention for these animals, um, in in a little way, we're we're we're, we're contributing to. You know these animals coming in because we're part of we're part of the supply and demand. You know mm -hmm. we obviously want these animals and we own them as pets, but uh, other people always want them as well in the droves. And so you know it draws in the the necessity to have them shipped over. Now this process, this process for the animal is uh, basically heart wrenching. Um, you know from the capture. Now the capture can be kind of bad, but it can also be you know uh, I guess uh, really torturous where. These animals are, you know, shoved in little bottles, tied up by their hind legs, almost, you know, tied up like hog tied, where yeah. they're now on a stake waiting for the next guy to the, the, the carrier to carry them back to wherever they're on. Because the, the poacher, he's not really going to carry all those monitors on him. He's basically mm -hmm. going to stake and then he's going to tie them to the stake and they're all going to sit there for the courier to come. And then, um, you know, from that situation... They either go to a meat market or they get sold on the pet trade. So that torturous part just ends for them there if they, they go to the meat market or they end up in the pet trade where this is now prolonged. The torture is more so of um, they're, you know, tied up, put in bags, stuffed, pooping, defecating, all that on each other, probably regurgitating on each other. Females that are gravid are nesting if they haven't been pulled already to be to be just um i guess discarded after they've laid in captivity when they've been captured um so you know this process now it's just this had they haven't even left they haven't even left the islands yet they haven't even gone to the 
to the to the distributor yet so um they're still now just being ready to be sold and so they'll go to they'll sit there and they'll wait they they're not probably really going to be fed it like how you and i would be extensively trying to nurture them they're just probably going to be watered lightly sprayed hosed off things like that just to kept clean for the buyer right? right um you know some animals that are really top notch may be kept aside but these are going to be shipped just like any other little lizard and right. so um they don't really care for them in this sense they're 60 dollars lizards when they come to america you know people are paying 100 bucks for them by if you buy six you know so um the if they're a blue tree maybe a little bit more care but we also see blue trees come in like dirt you know being treated yeah. like dirt and so even mm -hmm. if they are a magnificent animal um and so you know going to that part you're now let's say some guy is a importer exporter he's going to buy them and that process is long too just getting shipped here that may take weeks and months then traveling overseas to get here not over a plane not overnight not one or two days but we're talking time inside those bags cramped in crates and and then they're once they get to america they're then dispersed and then you can tell what the process is here already mm -hmm. hit different distributors hit different stores you're basically now peddling little lizards everywhere and you know this is this is the process and so these animals before they get to you go through all of that and and yeah. more because i was being really light on it they're going through much more so um for people that are getting into roughnecks um there's a certain way to essentially acclimate them you know and mm -hmm. um there's it's not just a simple heat them and feed them type deal um claire do you you kind of uh are are pretty familiar with uh that that whole process right as far as acclimating or knowing how to acclimate right would you kind of go through what the process would be for somebody that is just getting their own and obviously they got a a crummy looking sort of dehydrated lizard you know what, what would you recommend so i can't speak much on terms of you know the acclimation of fresh imports necessarily but i have learned a great deal i mean like hours of hours of conversations with guy um about proper setup for these animals because i was originally preparing to maybe get a fresh import luckily i did end up with a long-term captive um yeah. but you know from my understanding it it is more than just putting them in a four by two by two with you know a layer of dirt and uh, a halogen bulb really you want to be setting them up in larger enclosures with proper thermosiles thermo thermo gradients um and uh setting them up with a lot of substrate too uh one of the things that guy has suggested um over the years is that you know setting them up in a six by two by three or something similar to that um, and providing them with 24 seven heat, which I don't personally do. I like providing them with daytime heating, uh, and then nighttime heating. There's a difference between that. Um, he uses 24 seven lighting, which in terms of like fresh imports, I would say is completely makes sense because, you know, you want to be able to allow that animal to bask when it wants, but also be able to hide, um, whenever it wants. And that's one of the big things, allowing them um, with like eight to 12 inches of substrate, maybe of like cocoa fiber or um, cocoa fiber mixed with topsoil. Personally, I use um, cocoa fiber, which works amazingly with keeping humidity as well as um, holding up those burrows and those tunnels. And they, baby roughnecks, every person that I have heard from when they provide proper um substrate amount and um type of substrate their babies just disappear and which mm -hmm. is totally understandable you know if i was a baby roughneck and i had just gone through this horrendous process of being exported from my country to a brand new one and being thrown into an enclosure you know i would want to hide all the time which makes perfect sense um you know you have to let them be on their own for a while. I know Guy has said, you know, I've left him up for 
over like a month just not handling them, just providing them with food, water, and all the basic necessities to kind of get them back up and running. And I know that what he does is mainly do more with um, mice and more fattier foods just to get that weight back on them, um, providing them with a good tub of water, providing them with proper humidity. You know, I would say the exact same temperatures and humidity that I use for my adults, for my adult, and just providing them with that stability. And if you do notice them just not getting any better, then maybe it would be time to just be like, you know what, I'm just going to take them over to the vet, get them hydrated, get them looked at, you know, maybe treated for parasites. But that isn't always the best case because I have heard that um, some animals just don't react well to that parasite treatment and it can actually yeah. worsen them. I know that that's something that you had mentioned, Kai, to me, which right. I did not know originally. And so, that was really uh, interesting to understand. Maybe if you can get your point of view on that. Um, really, uh, you just don't want to, I mean, to make it short, right? But Because I will explain it, but what you don't want to do is an animal that doesn't have any sustenance in it and it's dehydrated will basically wither and die faster from those medicines kicking its butt initially right. okay so that's what we don't want to do now all right for anybody that's listening to this and let's say someone gets something and the first thing you're going to do shouldn't really be get it to the vet, you know, get a parasite, you know, get, get all the parasites treated and everything like that. What you want to do is get water into that animal and get some sustenance into that animal, whether it be for a few weeks, not just a couple of days, because that doesn't do a whole lot. Okay. But you're, you know, you're going to get Pedialyte into that animal. You're going to have a drink, drink water, defecate, basically not be blocked up, hold food, eat food, gain a little bit of weight. Sometimes if that moves forward, you don't even need to do anything. But mm -hmm. let's say if you are having issues and you do want to just make sure they're clear, you then go to the vet with samples of the fecal matter and or they're going to, um, you know, the, 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 the floater and the sample of the fecal matter is what they're going to ask for if you want to be really strict on the medicine that you're going to give your animal. You just don't want to bang it with panic here and call it a day. That's not what you want to do, okay? And um, so you want to have the right type of medicine for the right type of parasite. Um, now, if you got an animal that, you know, is somewhat decent looking, has is, is sustaining some weight, but you just want to go get it checked out, bring in samples and go talk to a vet. And then, you know, I don't want to have – I don't, I don't want to be a – a, a vet for the next couple of minutes and explain to you what, what you should do. Cause it's, it's quite a process, but you just don't want to want to just pump it full of drugs and, and um, them being really dehydrated and essentially malnourished from the get go is, is bad for you to do. If you did that, you want to make sure they're a little bit pumped with, with food and water for some time first. Um, did you want to add anything? I wanted to talk to, to add, added another little piece to, to this as well. <laughs> Um, <coughs> yeah. um, Al, Alan, sorry. Excuse me there. Um, yeah, I, I focus on the same thing when I was putting together my groups of the uh, Indonesian dwarf monitors. It was number one um, was actually hydration. Um, <clears throat> Got to get them hydrated so they can function. Uh, just if, if any of you or any living thing, you know, you're low on that water. Uh, your body does not work right. Your brain starts shutting down. Um, and I've seen animals, dehydrated animals, basically on death's doorstep and a little bit of water yeah. goes a long way. Um, on that note, too, it's not as simple sometimes, depending on your animal, is just dropping them in a bucket of water and soaking them. That's going to freak them out sometimes. They're not going to drink. So uh, while I do recommend, you know, maybe soaking those animals, um, <clears throat> getting anything that's on a, their skin, just stuck, you know, get it off of there. Uh, maybe they'll drink, maybe they can absorb a little water that way. But um, along with offering them, like I said, some, some watered down Pedialyte. Um, also kind of watch your animal, set up uh, maybe the cage in a way that you can observe the animal, but it can still stay hidden. And some animals won't drink standing water. 
So yeah. you might have everything available to that animal, but it's still not going to get that water into its body. So sometimes you have to spray the, um, the enclosure uh, and they'll lick it off the walls. And one of the things that worked for me doing this was, and to get animals hydrated that kind of learn is, um, if they like to hide or you know they're gonna hide in a cork tube, or you can actually limit them to just that cork tube as the only hide, place it close to the wall where they can just stick their head out and look off the wall. Um, yeah. So simple things like that. But yes, um, water is number one for me and then food. And then after you get them healthy that way, some weight back on them, then I would start worrying about uh, treatment. Yeah. Care, so. Now um, for, for me, okay. You're talking to a person that has kept them for quite a long time, and I have never, ever used dewormer stuff. Um, not that, I mean, could be a couple of reasons because I couldn't afford to get them before, um, but getting animals back from near death by just having a pretty solid enclosure with good humidity and great heat really help them balance the fight with the parasites okay now some understanding with parasites and how they work and why why this understanding is somewhat important now um uh scientists have mentioned to me when i was really young as well and this is what i gathered from it where they brought up the fact that if parasites was all over the world and in every animal, all of them would be dead if we thought of, of how bad they were. Every single animal would be dead. But that's not true. They're still alive, still kicking, still basically surviving with those parasites in them. And they look pretty well decent, even if they do have that load. It's a balance that that animal is carrying. Now, obviously, I don't want you to just leave parasites in your animal if you know he's got them. But, you know, then you take care of the right precautions. But you're just not, you know, banging it with some panic here and calling it a day. That's not, you know, not what it is. So now for going back to what I was saying and as far as my enclosures and setting up new ones or animals, I got that. They just came in really, really tough. Or even if they were captive bred, they came in really tough. I kind of have an enclosure that is generating good humidity within itself as well. Now... Drinking water and eating isn't anything if you can't sustain this animal to have optimum temperatures and humidity to be controlled within that enclosure. Yeah. You'll just dehydrate again, and you'll basically be working at your own. You'll be working against yourself. So um, I think as as Claire mentioned, or Guy and other roughneck keepers or monitor keepers that you, when you've got a an animal that has come to you all dehydrated, that dense, pretty hot enclosure – is uh, dense heat, humidity and heat is going to carry you a long way in acclimating your animal. Um, and so that's, you know, pretty high humidity, not exactly wet. So you have to use a fair amount of soil to that is moist itself and it's heated and that generates humidity. And keeping an enclosure that doesn't vent too much, either vents perfectly with good air convection or just slightly enough and not a ton of loss air airflow um you know that traps in your humidity a lot better for your animal and um, this is where that acclimating part really is solidified for them where all right now they can also bask really high and it's also said that if you have now i don't know if this is 100 true but if you have really high basking temperatures they're able to just excrete them themselves or get rid of the parasites themselves yeah. I don't know how 100% true this is, but having great optimum temperatures probably also allows that balance and helps out um, keeping the parasites at bay. Um, and that is where I think the how natural the natural wild works, where if things have parasites, there's still a balance in keeping the, them at bay. Yeah. So um, as far as my understanding, I, I, I would love to go in more detail with that, but, you know, um, that is... Uh, helpful for people that are getting roughnecks that need to be acclimated well and this is that that was your key right there is to basically make sure that things are dense for them um 
Now, as far as Claire, uh, your 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 current setup and how you got to make that, um, what did you end up using to make your current setup? So right now, I'm actually going to be setting up a new enclosure soon. So uh, right now, what I have is basically a couple cork tubes that I got at the show um, that I met you at. And, um, you know, I have that kind of in arboreal settings so then she can climb up it and she picks the hardest way to get up to her enclosure. Um, I do <laughs> not know why. It's it's one of her main things. She picks the hardest way to go through something because it just works for her. Um, yeah. She. I make it so then she has uh, two, well, she technically has three basking spots. So I have one near um, where her height is on the bottom of her enclosure. And then she can go up there and then bask kind of in the morning, kind of just to get that energy going back up. And then she goes to the higher level, the 140 to 150 Fahrenheit basking spot. And then she just likes to sit there for maybe five minutes and then go down to the mm. lower level that's actually around 130 Fahrenheit and then she just kind of sits there for probably 15 minutes and then comes down and maybe goes back into her water um, and then maybe climbs back up goes to bask maybe lets me know that she wants to come out so she'll sometimes come right up to the glass and then sit and wait for me to look at her because she knows that if I'm sitting in front of her that she she will let me know that she wants to come out. So I'm like, okay. And then I open up the door. She warms around my room for a little bit. And I think that's one of the big things that, um, you know, I have the ability as a single monitor keeper. Um, I can let her do that. And I have the space to do that. You know, not everybody has that ability to. And really, that should only be used for adults who are comfortable around you. Um, you know, you don't want to be letting out a skittish adult or a baby for that matter. But she's uh, yeah. 39. And you won't find it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you she won't find it. Yeah. She's a uh, 39 inch long monitor lizard, so I don't think I'm going to miss her. Um, and she's she's very, very docile. You know, I, I do not know how I've been able to get her to this point, um, but I work with her daily. And I uh, that's it. You're consistent. with yeah. it. You know, that's uh, that's all we really try to have people learn is it takes consistency. Now, you know, I can be really vague and just say. Um, you know, be consistent, but it's the regular, it's how much you put in work with it. You know, your, yeah. the build, the, you took it from a crummy situation too. And then you gave it something basically the best it can have, you know? Um, and so really that animal is, I would say really cued into what you're doing on an, on an, on a normal basis, as far as letting it out, it's, essentially desensitized to your your home and and um that would normally make most lizards pretty nervous you know mm -hmm. um and so your your animal is out and that's those are great things that uh, people that just won't have a couple pets you know this is you don't want to just allow any type of skittish animal like you said out because you, you, that animal is really unpredictable you want them to be um, I use the word tractable and that's kind of easy to find easy to, you know, you kind of get, get an idea where they're going. They themselves kind of stay out up in the open rather than tucking away. Most of my stuff, uh, they're going to go behind something. Even the tame ones, they're, in, they're so annoying. They're so, <laughs> you know, so, I really don't want to have to let them out and have to go behind the cage and have to like, yeah. Or, them ripping at stuff or i've had I, I i one time let a old now monitor out and it ended up getting into a tiny little hole that was in the wall and it yeah. made the hole bigger and ended up in the wall and um yeah i was an idiot and so um you know yeah keep going with with uh how now how did you make how did you build your cage what is it made out of so um my enclosure is not the most ideal because I went into it not realizing that's, that's that that mold it's, it's, all, it's, it's all good yeah 
that mold is a very, very, very big factor, um, especially when creating these enclosures. You know, I've had, I have had an issue with mold, like developing on the back of her enclosure. And that's one of the main reasons that I'm like, I'm shooting for a new enclosure. And the new enclosure, I actually tested out on my reticulated pythons <laughs> enclosure first. And his is even, he has a melamine enclosure, which is, if you guys know melamine, it does not hold up to humidity at all. But I've been able to keep like 75 to 90% humidity in there without any mold issues. And the way that I was able to do that was using my secret and my, I love it so much, using plastic wall panels. And yes. <laughs> these things, they're cheaper than the fiberglass wall panels because I know that people, some people use those. But these things are like $25 for an eight, a four by eight sheet of it. And it's only about 0.6, um, 0.06 inches thick. And it doesn't seem very thick, um, but it's thick enough that it will, um, as long as you adhese it first to your enclosure, you know, via um, gluing it or um, using screws to kind of get it in there and then going around the edges and actually using sil like 100% GE silicone, which is safe yeah. for reptiles. And that way, that's how I'm going to mainly be making my enclosure for my roughneck. But instead of using melamine, I'll be using, you know, something more um, durable like a uh, OSB um, or CDX or plywood and such like that. And one of the big things that's actually helped me a lot with building this large enclosure is using a 3D design software called Tinkercad. And this actually allowed me to look at, you know, my my design, how I wanted it to look, and then making it in there and seeing all the materials that I would need in a 3D model so then I could easily build it and make sure that that design is going to be what I want and what's going to work for the thing that I need it for, which is my my roughneck. And that's a big thing, just not making sure that no wood is exposed because Wood will just mold, and I did not know that when I first built my enclosure. And after a while, I'm like, nope, I do not want any exposed wood in my enclosure. And, you know, some people are like, oh, I don't have an issue with it. And I'm like, I have an issue with it. I don't know what to <laughs> do about it. Um, Nasty. <laughs> yeah. Not only that, it can, rot, it can rot through the bottom, and yeah. if you got to pick it up, it's just – it's it's gross and we really don't want that it means bad for your animal it's bad for you it's bad for the house Definitely. you really don't want standing mold mm -hmm. um you know it's not it's not really good for anything um and so that uh don't you don't get me wrong now i know uh, i seem a little bit hesitant to talk about your molding cage we've all had those cages don't oh, get yeah. me wrong uh, i've had what I thought would be great in melamine stuff like that. Or <laughs> um, I even reinforced it, cocked it myself again. Um, and the monitors find their way to undo the cocking because they're, yep. they're smart and they're dicks. And, <laughs> and so, um, you know, really, uh, um, it gets in between the, the, the cocking that they've exposed and so yeah. um, the water that I need and the dirt mm -hmm. and stuff like that, I have a couple areas that um, in my enclosure I keep dry purposely so that way it doesn't mold, you know. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've grown to build better cages. But, man, I've, I've had cages where I just pop together, you know, put a window on it and called it a day where I didn't do anything back then. And those cages would basically rot in six months, right? They'd, right. they'd, show, they'd show, like, um just not not just mold but you can basically see it deteriorating as you right. add it there's so much it's the heat humidity moisture all that all that in one and yep. there's probably springtails breaking down that raw wood too itself just eating eating at it you know and so uh <laughs> it's, it's uh we've all had that and um what'd you do you just use like plywood before or you use the melamine or so um for my original enclosure, I just drew it on paper and I was like, oh my God, this is going to be great. Um, hey, we I all been used, there. <laughs> I, and then it was crap. <laughs> <laughs> and I used like one eighth inch plywood 
and oh, yeah. amazingly, it stood up. It stood up to her claws, and I used like three fourths inch, um, like OSB on the bottom. And what I realized is that I put. I realized that that was not a good idea. So, it, in order to kind of um, prevent any mold from getting down, seeking seeping into the OSB on the bottom, I used a pond liner. And mm -hmm. that did not hold up to her claws very well. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I had to just replace it like every three months or something. And, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't really care. Like I could literally be drilling something in her enclosure and she just look at me like, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Desensitized. I love that. I can do the same thing. I go in there. Hey guys, I'm about to do something right here. Just stay over there. Um, but they always come over and expect I have food. And they're very interested in what you are doing. And uh, yeah, one of the things is that sometimes she will just if I'm doing something in her enclosure, she wants to see what I'm doing, and she will go to the bottom level and then climb up over her substrate barrier, go up my paint leg, and then sit on top of my shoulder and be like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and I'm like, uh, "She likes the height, huh? Get yeah. up there on top." But, she, yeah. She, you know, the interesting thing is she's she's very interesting because she likes to sit up on top of my head. And it's understandable because she likes to be up high. She likes to see everything. Um, sometimes she'll go up to the window um, while I'm maybe doing something in her enclosure. And then she'll come out. She'll go. She'll just climb up on my bed. And I've actually, I don't think I've trained her necessarily. But uh, she's started to only defecate on a single plastic sheet that's maybe uh, three by four feet. And she just, she just defecates right there every time she comes out. And I've had, I haven't yeah. had a single issue in maybe a week or two, which is pretty good for her. Um, that's, that's cool, man, because I have crap everywhere. <laughs> I mean, my lizards, I pull them out and they're just, I have to not face their bottom towards yeah. my face. A couple yeah. times, like they'll, they've got me where it's like on my chest, it's splattered on my face and I just want to yeet this little lizard across the cage, but you know, I'm just like, <laughs> all right, I'm just going to put you back. You've pissed me off, but there's not much I can really do. Yeah. Um, but man, they're, 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 I have. You know, there's fecal matter everywhere that I have to hose off. And, um, yeah, I'm basically always pulling stuff out. But, yeah, you're lucky to have um, have it defecate in just a piece of plastic. Yeah, yeah you're, and, you're and that's one trained. of the, the other things that she does. She only defecates in her water bowl. Like, every single time, it's always in there. And it's, it's like, the exact same thing with all, almost all roughneck owners that I have encountered. They say... They always poop in their water, like nowhere else. Yeah, most of my animals do too. It's 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 quite common, but they also defecate everywhere. Though. <laughs> it's still in their water. Yeah. I give mine small water bowls. <laughs> Try to help myself out. <laughs> um, one of the things that I did want to talk touch on is um how roughnecks their bite. Their bite is very interesting, and I've been bitten by my roughneck four or five times, all because of human error. And I almost got bit two day, like yes, yesterday night when I was feeding her a mouse, and she almost went for my toes because I was I was luring her around the um, the stairs, and she saw my toes, and she thought that looks like a good snack, but she was, yeah. I, I grabbed her by the base of her tail and I said, Nope, not today, Satan. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things is, is that you do not want to get bit by a roughneck because their teeth are so, so serrated. And it's just like, it will just tear your skin like that. And it does not. And when you're doing your research, right? What was their, um, do they eat like crustaceans and stuff like that? Yeah. So the, mm -hmm. the thing is, is that they have mostly their diet is made up of 
insects, like larger-ish insects, smallish insects, um, but they do have some crabs in their diet. So, but the interesting thing is, is that those crab, that, that crab-based diet was only found in a specimen from Thailand near the coast. And I wonder if maybe it's just a thing with Thailand specimens that they are more adapt to eating um, crustaceans or maybe even fish. But the thing is, is that I do not think that roughnecks are very good at adapted to eating prey that's out or not out under the water. Because even though there's some species, I know um, mertens easily will just dive down and grab, you know, a, cr a crustacean or something or um, water monitors. But roughnecks, they cannot see underwater. And I do not know if it's just a thing with my individual, but when I put um, her in a bathtub with like 12 inches of water, she would try, she would see it up above the, the surface of the water and then try to dive down and then miss every single time because she closes her eyes. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's just something with her individual species um, or just her as an individual, but it's just, I don't think that they are adapt to eating uh, species, like their prey underwater. Like they will prefer to eat it above water or above ground, basically. Um, and, you know, I think those teeth are just... Right. I, I don't know. They... I've, I've tried to take a picture of her teeth, like a macro shot of them, and it was really weird. I do not know this for sure because I just found out about it like a couple days ago is that her tooth looked like it was almost transparent and I hadn't released this any anything yet just because I don't know for sure but it looked like it was transparent which was very very strange like I took a macro picture of her tooth when she was grabbing on to um, like an egg or something like that and she just like it just looked transparent. I don't know if you guys can give any information on that, but it, it was very mm. strange. Um, Most of the teeth that I see are, yeah, like they're cloudy. They're not, they're not clear, but they're cloudy. Yeah. Like opaque. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, yeah, opaque. Um, not exactly white because they're, I mean, they're small and little diamond, little jagged things, you know, they're, they're not like big, hard teeth like ours. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they're hard in their own sense, but um, I think it's because they're so small and sharp and pointy. There, there's no density to create the thick whiteness, you know. Right. And so the the teeth themselves are probably going to have a an opaque look. That's what I've been used to. Yeah, I never knew that. I was like kind of stunned to see that, and I was like, what? What the hell is this? <laughs> this is so strange. <laughs> you know, for me being being a relatively new monitor keeper, um, I'm still finding out things every day. And I know that even experienced keepers are finding out new things every day. But I'm like always finding out new things. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, it's almost overwhelming. But it's just. Yeah. I it's, it's you've only been there for two years. So wait till you're like at five or six <laughs> years. And then you yeah. learn. You learned a whole lot by then. They had, they've had, they would have had to go through um, life cycles and all that stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, is that I, I really do want to gain more experience. And I know that's one of the big things in the animal hobby experience is like literally everything. And if you don't have that, and a lot of people, you know, me being young and especially um, a girl, a lot of the, 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 the hobby is dominated by men and people who have a lot of experience. And I'm just coming into this with, you know, I know a couple things about roughnecks and retics and mangrove snakes. Um, and I have this much research done, but I don't have the experience. And I'm going to be working on breeding projects in the future. Um, I plan to 100% do it with roughnecks. Like that is one of my main goals that I'm going for. And I've actually contacted the college that I was interested in. And I said, hey, I'm wanting to work with this uncommon species that isn't commonly captive bred. And I want to be able to live off campus in order to work with that species. And I'm looking into maybe going into being a vet tech. So they were kind of understanding about that. 
but um, you know, that's one of the big things that I have to worry about is, you know, what's going to happen when I do go into college. And that's, a, that's one of the things with um, people who are my age uh, where we struggle with. Yeah. You'd, you'd end up having to find it a great home or something like that, or have your parents take care of it at the very <laughs> least. I, like that, or I don't stay close. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to let my parents take care of them. No, no offense to them. But I have um, the nice thing is that I actually have somebody while they are in Florida, um, they would not give up their herp collection. I know if anything did change in Florida, they would probably move out of there. But they have experience with roughnecks. Um, her name is Tara and she lives down in southern Florida and she's got a couple roughnecks, one that actually sadly passed away. But um, her too, she's working on a breeding project with them. And I would be like, you know what, if I can't take care of my female, you know, you are welcome to, um, have her for a little while until I'm able to get her back. And she was all for it. And I was, I'm glad to be able to have those connections. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's good. It makes it less heartbreaking. Yeah. And I mean, I always, yeah, I would definitely too. commend that. Huh? Well, go oh. with that now. Yeah, I was saying I definitely commend that. Um, you know, it's hard to, to give up an animal, but if you not not permanently, but uh, just you know that daily interaction is something you really love to work with. Um, yeah, but I to get it into it. the hand, yeah, but to get it into the hands of someone and make those um, mm. arrangements prior to being in that um, that bind is a very smart thing to do. I, I you know it being on this side of things, it, it worked out for me. There was someone that was going to college mm -hmm. and. Waited to the last second, and that's how I ended up with a large group of lizards. But, um, you know, I know that person loved working with them. So uh, definitely, if you can't, for whatever reason, take it with you while you're doing uh, going to college, make those arrangements in advance just to be on the safe side. But, uh, you know, something I wanted to kind of talk about, too, with uh, when we were talking about going to the vet, taking care of animals. Um, and those Yeah, I do it all the off. time now. I mean, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I see your pictures, but are you going for? You're not going for antibiotics for the most part, are you? Or is it just? Yeah. Uh, I'm going for. Yeah. I'm going for everything that I can learn. Um, gotcha. Oh, looks like we got clear back. Thank you. Yep. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Sorry about that. I was no just worries. For a second. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were um, lost. I was telling Kai real quick that um, yeah, it's with uh. Antibiotics, we touched back on that real quick because it also knocks out good yeah. bacteria. That's, that's so, good I, <laughs> I uh, kind of go through, uh, go to the vet for for everything. Sorry, I, I didn't want, I, um, I didn't want to, were you, you were still saying something, right? Oh, um, I was just, no, I was I'm, just mentioning. Uh, I'm sorry, Alan, Alan uh, do you still have something to say about the bad bacteria part? Oh, no, I just, I shy away from, um, from antibiotics, antibiotics just to uh, i'm afraid of killing off that good bacteria if the animal seems to be bouncing back on its own uh now if, if there's obviously an infection especially something you're seeing you know i don't i don't hesitate to rush that animal down and start working on that but when the, i have no uh outward signs and just as kind of a precaution uh i skip that step if i'm being honest yeah. you know because i'm i'm in my head, they're working it out for themselves, and uh, I don't want to put any extra stress on them. Uh, Claire, you go to the vet, right? Yeah, I've been to three vets uh, over the course of keeping. Uh, one of them, I was absolutely distraught by her answer. She thought that she, not to be someone who you know thinks that I know more, but in this situation, her automatic uh, response to me saying, you know, this is a roughneck monitor. She went on to Reptile Magazine and said, uh, you do not know this information. You know, it's obvious that you haven't done your research. And I said, um, no, I think I have. And I actually got into a uh, argument with her, unfortunately. And I uh, swore never to go back to that bed again because yeah. she gave me some very unhelpful information uh, because this is wh back when I didn't touch on this yet, but my female actually got a burn at one point because I uh, had too low of temps mm -hmm. and like my ambient temperatures were too low. 
and my basking spot was relatively high and she was staying under there for too long. And then it just, uh, you know, it was a very fast thing. I didn't notice it. And then I noticed it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you have a burn. And I, you know, this was in the first, I think, six months of me keeping her. And it was kind of a shock. And a lot of people, you know, were able to help me out. And I ended up just using silver sulfadizing. And that just worked like a charm yeah. on her. And that's one of the things the vet said that I couldn't use it on her because her her burn had already scarred over. And um, I went to another vet and they said, you know, actually you can use it we're going to prescribe it to you and it worked out pretty well in the end and her like it was a relatively bad ish burn it was very spotty on her back but it's almost completely healed up now like it is amazing that it has healed up as well as it has but i i continued that treatment for probably four to six months um, every day putting on new cream and it worked like a charm. Yeah. yeah. Silver I cream works. It's great. <laughs> I love that stuff. I it's use it for wounds. I use it for scars. Uh, yeah. And for those listeners out there that don't know what it is, go ahead and look it up. Um, there's a few name brands, a few other, there's, I think one's a cream, one's a gel. Uh, as long as they have that silver content, uh, you, you'll find it, it on a lot work. Of, yeah, yeah, a lot of medical type of uh, like CVS should have a, a generic one. Yeah. Now they used to have straight up silver cream. You can just get it. It says silver cream on it, but yeah. they, they no longer have that over the counter. It's they have like a the silver ingredient, but it's very low within it. I didn't really like it when I used it, so I had to go and get prescribed silver cream from the vet. Um, mm -hmm. This is stuff that's strong. Like it's, it work, I, I believe, in my opinion, compared to the two, it also stays on better because it's more like a paste. The gel in the heat, the gel just kind of slides off, you know, but yeah. this kind of sticks on. So um, that's why I use this. Um, and uh, the, uh, the silver cream, get yourself some if you, you think that uh, you ever have uh, to deal with any animal that has wounds or something like that. Um, now, um, you asked me earlier about like what I go to the vet for and stuff. Um, really, to, to finish up this conversation about going to the vet, but I really go to answer the questions I have that I have guessing in my head. I don't mm -hmm. want to keep guessing. I do that all the time, and I stress myself out, kind of think about how things would play out, pop a scenario in there on how it might work out, and then um, you know it, it can lead in two different directions where it may work out for me or it's going to end up really bad. But so um, like figuring out if she's gravid or not and, and going with the flow or, or seeing if uh, uh, like a lizard after she laid has an egg or two still in her. So I take them in um, occasionally I was having issues with them not bouncing back so much. And so it wasn't that they had eggs in them. They just weren't, uh, they, they just were really lethargic after they laid. And so, you know, I, instead of having it questioned in my head where, oh, is there a lizard, is there a couple eggs left in her? I took her to the vet and they answered the question for me, you know. Um, gotcha. You get x-rays, you get blood work done. Um, I do go for my meds, though, because I have yeah. animals that get infections possibly all the time. Or they get bit and, you know, they hang out in wet soil or, or they hang out in the water dish or something like that. And, yeah, so... Um, and then since I keep it around. Yeah. Yeah. I, sh I shy away. Uh, if I'm being very honest, I shy away from the vet on a lot of things. Um, I just, I, I guess from when I kept uh, reptiles originally, there wasn't a lot of good information out. Yeah. Um, and there's still not. And right. I think I'm only okay with it because I go to Dr. Greek. Um, yeah. It seems like you got a good vet. Yeah. He goes, he's actually one of the well-renowned vets in, California, probably one of the best in Southern California. And so, Claire, if you can drive an hour and come upwards inland, um, he's in Yorba Linda. Okay. And, um, and uh, he's really good. Now, you're probably going to say whatever you spent at, in San Diego, um, you'll probably save with whatever you're going to spend in gas 
at at his prices just because i mean man i, I kind of go in there get blood work x-ray medicine all of that and the visit <coughs> for like 150 bucks so wow. you know that's, when yeah that's I'm, amazing I'm, <laughs> usually really oh um, no. usually i'm spending you know 80 bucks for a visit and then for everything else it's it easily adds up just to 180 250 i've i've spent probably well over six or eight hundred dollars on just treating both of my animals um individually over um over the time that i've had them and it's just it's a lot just mm -hmm. and the, i mean i'm glad that you know my parents have uh sometimes taking the vet's word over mine <laughs> and uh especially when it comes to husbandry uh, I've been told to put my roughneck on repti carpet. I've been told to have a 98 uh, Fahrenheit basking spot. Not the the brightest yeah. moments in the vets. Yeah, um, vets are very the limited. There, it's just uh, most of them aren't keeping them. You know, not very many are reptile keepers. I don't know. It's yeah. just yeah. Uh, you know not very. But um, luckily, the vet that I go to, he is a reptile keeper himself. And he's been kind of doing it for a while. Um, not only that, he knows the anatomy. So that's what I don't know. You know, I don't know the anatomy that great. So I wish I could study it a little bit more, but he knows it in and out, even on, on the actual animal. I'm just looking at pictures, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I it might be a good I was whatever. interrupted, Kai. Go ahead. You're finished. No, no, I just said it might be a good idea for you to come up another 30, 45 minutes go to someone that is great with it. He sees all my monitors all so far and um, you can continue your your visit. Like let's say you, you needed to treat something. Your next visit is basically an, a continuation to that one. So it's like a checkup that's free and it's, yeah, oh, it's, wow. it's great. And he can keep- What was his name again? Name's Dr. Say? Greek. Dr. Dr. Greek? Greek? Yeah, his name's Dr. Greek and the place is called Greeks and Associates. I'm a little yeah. jealous. I'll be honest. Now we do have a we do have a, a good reptile vet up here. Um, there's some things I think that differ a little bit with monitors specifically, uh, just because of their uh, oh, unique needs, uh, their operating temperatures. You know, uh, kind of how they are very close. They're 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 still cold blooded animal, but they are very close to operating in daily functions like a mammal would. To some degree um and it's always just for any of the listeners listeners out there it is always good to have a vet just because when something does come down and you need even if you knew how to treat it a lot of times you still have to go through a vet to get that prescription for that antibiotic or uh you know the, yeah. the, the measurements yeah yeah um, weight yeah all that stuff um to add on, the one of the good places to find a reptile vet is um, arav.org, and you can find a vet near you. And it's it's the way that I was able to find, you know, people who were experienced, and I was able to call those people and ask them, you know, what type of experience you have, um, you know, what type of standing do you have with arav arav, um, you know, that those sort of things, and those help me out a lot but just wanted to add that on <laughs> well that's good yeah. stuff i didn't know that website so i think and and that other one you mentioned earlier the cad website i'm gonna be uh looking at that a little bit too yeah i've seen i've seen her do uh, share that a couple times online I'd, i've uh i did that once um and what i what i always feel about my enclosures it's like the, well, however i draw them and however it ends up, it's different. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, um, space. And I, I mean, maybe I'm not uh, counting every little detail that I am within the blue turf. That, that's what sucks, right? You can't account unless like you were able to get like every single inch and every single centimeter on, on spacage, even between like branches, right? Or stuff like that. Um, I, I just have to, I, I don't know if I account for that all that well. And so when it comes time to really, 
putting in everything, it's like, oh man, I, I'm using less logs because I didn't account for all that space or, or now I have to simplify it a little bit more or I can't hang something a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. so all things, um, all, things always change. You know, one of the big things is I found a lot of ways to be able to format your enclosure. One of the best ways, obviously, is the Tinkercad just because it's so simple and anyone could figure it out if you have, like, basic knowledge of, um, you know, working with height and making sure that you are, you know, putting it in the right angle and whatnot. But one of the big things is that um, what I actually have been doing recently, because I've actually uh, been working with some people who uh, needed bearded dragon enclosures uh, created. And what I would do is create it on Tinkercad and then send them a supplies list and then go and take that a screenshot of it of different angles of the enclosure and then put it in this program called procreate and um, I have an iPad so I use like the Apple pencil and I take pictures of the supplies or they send me pictures of their supplies that they have the dimensions of it and then I um, scale that dimension in my um, my program and then I'm able to actually create an enclosure like the whole entire setup but in a digital format, like more of a 2D format um, using their own supplies or my own supplies. And I can actually see how I'm going to position everything, how everything fits um, and just seeing if overall I like it. And it's, it's really important to me because I like to be able to figure everything out beforehand and um, not mess up because I have in the past and I regret yeah. that. No, it's um, good to have a plan. It's good to have a plan. Yeah, but that's this is it's really great to be able to have access to programs like these um, and just be able to gauge how you want to set things up and figure out what fits, what doesn't, and then figure out the best setup for your animal. Yeah, I could probably spend hours on it. Maybe I shouldn't look at this program. Yeah. <laughs> for me, I just, uh, I just put a box together, right? And the best thing is the important part. And then I figure out, all right, what's going in here? And then I yeah. figure out where the lamp's going to go. Um, typically, all my enclosures are built to support a fair amount of soil, so I don't really have to worry about that part, right? The lip's kind of high. It's like a foot or 10 inches or sometimes two-foot lips. Um, but, yeah, once I figure that out and figure out the size of the animal, and then I kind of, all right, how am I going to suspend this? I, I suspend everything with little fish hooks, fish eye hooks. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they're at the ceiling is of all my enclosures. Typically that I string like Spider-Man from one side to the next <laughs> side. They're just yeah. kind of hanging there. Yeah. They're just hanging there suspended. And, um, and then I also use like stuff on the walls. Like uh, I use fencing material or I'll use uh, cor um, cork wall or I I've used a few things. But um, really that's, that's all I'm doing is giving them – couple places to hide giving them vertical the vertical hanging ability um i still try to give them all the little bit abilities to do a fair amount of things just just not like extremely decked out and that's it i kind of just keep it simple from there um mm -hmm. so that's why i haven't i've always drunk trust me i've always trying to draw out something and i just learned all right i'm not it's not it's it's never gonna look this way because <laughs> <laughs> i draw it with the pool and i never put it in a pool <laughs> or something like that or i don't know you know yeah <laughs> i actually um for my next enclosure even though i'm only going to basically have it for a year um i really want to make it as naturalistic as possible um because i'm actually going to be working with the san diego zoo hopefully um getting into one of their internship programs maybe uh, next year and I'm already part of one of their programs for teenagers and I've gotten in contact with the curator um, of the herpetology department there and I've been very excited and um, you know I'm I'm wanting to make it to my own standards because right now my enclosure is not looking the greatest I mean it works don't get me wrong and it works for her 
um, but I really want to improve and I'm constantly looking for ways to improve my setup. So that means, you know, um, figuring out new things online, uh, going through Facebook posts um, on uh, advancing herpetological husbandry. That's a big, that's a big resources that I absolutely adore going through and looking at all their naturalistic setups. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm really looking to do is giving her more uh, water space, as well as giving her more substrate and giving her more options to bask at different places or um, even be under like little hides or in the cork tubes or whatever else. And one of the big one of the things that I really wanted to work on was maybe even a fake tree in there to um, because roughnecks in the wild, they normally go up the size of trees, maybe about 20, 40, 60 feet high even um, mm -hmm. to bask. And that's one of the things I was interested in maybe replicating, um, giving her that option to uh, utilize a natural way of, you know, doing something like basking, as basic as basking, which can make maybe a difference. Who knows? We're constantly learning new things and trying to improve as keepers. Yep. Right. I think, um, I think, ah, man, I need to look more at that Zupoxy product, but uh, I think there might be a couple of, um, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but they basically make a wrap that is a flexible material that you can kind of wrap around uh, something like a large cut PVC pipe. Um, so that the outside of it will actually be like a, a fake uh, bark. So you actually wrap it around this material and then you can adjust it and um, do some, some modifications to it to make it look more like a tree. Maybe if you cut in on the PVC pipe one direction or say you add a layer of uh, foam to it, um, uh, you can actually make like little knots on the tree and then it, it Seems to work pretty good now. I haven't tried it myself. I can't even remember the name, but I know these products are out there. So it might might be something worth looking at. Yeah, I've actually looked into Zupoxy, and uh, for me personally, it is not in my budget. <laughs> uh, me being unemployed and 17. So uh, I've, I've talked to the people who uh, I think that they, they're the... I don't remember who it was. I think it was Mike's monitors who I had gotten some suggestions for, and he has amazing setups. Um, I absolutely admire them. Uh, but I've been kind of trying to look and see if there's any other ways to, you know, still get the results that I want, but make it sure that it's monitor proof and mold proof. Um, because those are things that I've obviously run into quite a number of times. Like I've realized you shouldn't use hammocks in a heavily humid enclosure because uh, they will mold. You cannot yeah. use Mita in your heavily humid enclosures or they will mold. <laughs> I have had so much unfortunate experience with mold and it's very time consuming and disappointing. It's, it's all a, it's the process. You may have yeah. also a fair amount of too much humidity going on at one time if it's always 90%. Yeah. Yeah. And you might want to allow it to um, settle and go down to 60s and then take it back up. But yeah, giving that a little bit will eliminate some of your mold. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things is, is that I actually had added the computer fan in there to actually help circulate the air. And it, it does work very, very well to keep that humidity, I mean, that humidity from condensing on the walls and maybe making it mold or something like that or making um, something else mold. And in my new design, I'm going to be incorporating, hopefully, uh, vents that I can actually close off, especially when it gets very dry here. I have acclimated to 60% humidity in my room at all times. Yeah. So I do not like low humidity anymore. I cannot tolerate it. Uh, so when my room is humid, my animals are happy and I'm happy too, as long as there is proper circulation because hot <laughs> stuff yeah. does not work very well. <laughs> well, well man, it's, uh, I'm glad uh, 
you're able to figure out a fair amount with your roughneck within a couple of years. Um, you know, a lot of, like I said, again, a lot of people are, will kind of give up on them realizing just of how big of a feat it is to take care of one properly um, with just learning, figuring out the day to day. And this is not like something, okay. A lot of, a lot of newcomers come to me and kind of, think that everything is available on a care sheet it's yeah. not it's uh days and days and hours and hours of research and asking people and talking to people and and then you have that's just gathering information then you have to test it all <laughs> and so you know true scientists are true people that are really into science and getting getting all that figured out if once once you got that question in your head you know trying to figure out is your end game and so um with you uh man it's great to see uh keepers like you just getting into it all new and jumping into the deep end and still being able to ride it out as long as they're committed um and that's the one thing that it all the new keepers need to really take in is how committed are you mm -hmm. you know that how committed are you to to failing and how committed are you to, to 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 learn by these animals and and put your put your pride aside, put what you think you know aside, and and learn, you know? Um, yeah. Did you want to add anything, Claire? Um. Honestly, I fully agree with everything you've said. I have talked with a variety of new keepers. Every everybody from wanting, you know the most common leopard gecko or bearded dragon and helping them out with setup and understanding of those species to everything up to, you know, mangrove snakes and roughnecks who are like so on the other scale of these common easy-ish reptiles. And reptiles are never going to be easy. You know, a lot of people expect monitors especially to be almost like dogs or cats, but, you know, all the times that I would be like, oh, she's kind of like a dog or a cat, she's not. And I can never fully compare those our exotic animals to domestic animals because there's no, there's no comparison almost. Yeah. There, you know, and that's that's one of the big things that I, I experience a lot of new keepers think that they are going to be like that. Um, or they just want to have right. that animal and enjoy it instead of go through all of this time consuming process to research that animal and understand it. And that's one of the big things with especially wild caught species like roughnecks who are so impacted by various things from the pet trade to um, the uh, markets and deforestation or habitat loss or whatever else. Um, I, I say to people who want to get these wild caught animals that you have to be willing to work with a community of people who are interested in those animals also and learn about it as a community and share your findings with other people because that's one of the big things, you know, you can't just keep all that information to yourself because every person has their own individual experience and all of those experience can be either learned from or improved upon and just everybody yeah. needs to be working together to yeah. understand those species you got to think about all the animals that possibly could benefit from what you might know what mm -hmm. you might do. so um like picture me telling you that i love these mangroves but i don't help a soul do i really love the mangroves you know um mm -hmm. and so i want to see people succeed with the lizards sure i may talk about loving the animals and you know that's why we're here but um it's also a great thing to see people click with their animals as you're helping them you know um uh, so for me both of those kind of in turn is just the why i kind of or why we're creating this podcast for example or or why we're kind of taking it to the next step on um, really getting newcomers or beginners uh, acquainted with how we kind of do things as far as getting broken in, what to expect, the truths, you know, um, right. some of the buttered stuff, the sugar-coated stuff that, you know, you still want to know the, the real facts about, stuff like that. And so um, 
And yeah, it was it was a great pleasure having you on, Claire. Um, Thank you. You know, uh, as far as your extensiveness, uh, I really um, chose you because you can relate and people can relate to you as far as just getting a roughneck. I think a, a bunch of them just came in uh, as far as yeah. imports goes. And so, um, you know, this can go out to those people that are needing help. And when you yourself are running into, um, you know, sometimes we can't always type type up messages and messages and messages you know we're busy and so um this podcast is so you can kind of just uh copy and paste this information hopefully they can indefinitely learn what, what we're talking about on this podcast for roughneck keepers or other other monitors that are also imported poorly treated things like that and need more understanding you know we're barely even there we're just really about keeping right now getting them acclimated and how to take care of them sort of correctly but we don't even know how to breed them yet because mm -hmm. there's none produced in the u.s like like that and so there may be some here and there by random folk and they might get a little a little further than the last guy you know getting eggs or even some viable eggs but we haven't really had anything hatch out like that yet so um it'd be great for the next step in keeping roughnecks and or keeping other species that are like them what i mean by like them is hard to breed you know um and so getting more understanding on them being captive bred maybe by one guy maybe leads to the next guy just like you were saying claire you know you want to be able to help these people and and help these animals and the both of them to you know that's that's the only way i'll be able to really reach these animals is if i reach through these people you know Exactly. I wholly agree with you. There was a joke in there about uh, you were saying this guy and that guy and, uh, you know, guy actually working with him, but I, I skipped it. I skipped it. I'm <laughs> sure you can tie them together yourself. Guy, if you're out there listening, that one was for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, um, you know, like that, but just um, a devotion like that, you know, people where we, we're taking the, the time out of our day. We're trying to uh, puzzle and piece things where you can coherently understand everything and it's easily to digest and, um, you know, you, you easily relate it. To, to be honest, coming in new, you, you're not going to be able to understand everything until it's happening to you or mm -hmm. you're going it through yourself, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but hopefully, you know, through these uh, mm -hmm. conversations, these guests we get to have on um, – the answers won't be maybe so hard to find uh, or the different approaches. And it, you know, it might be something that we're talking about that works with a uh, Savannah and Aki or something, but just uh, an idea you picked up on a solution that you heard. Um, even if it's not monitor related, just building your overall knowledge in reptiles or cage building um, cage design, uh, simple things like we were talking about as far as airflow, the problems with too much humidity or too much uh, moisture. Um, mm -hmm. as That's the balance that you'd have to re be able to achieve with a, a big enclosure to keep that from over being oversaturated mm -hmm. and then learning. All right. And it's all about spacing things out, timing things when you're going to do things and then getting a routine to that. So I don't miss every day. Yeah. I maybe miss three times a week maybe and most of the time i'm going to be spritzing the warm area where the heat lamps are uh hosing off any poop to the isopods at the bottom and that's it you know right um it's not to make the whole enclosure wet i don't have the the cold side or the cooler side of my enclosure because i give them a a cooler side of about 70 75 still um that's dry i don't have any humidity really over there and so they can retreat over there. They're going to sleep there. And it's cooler there. And their belly scales aren't sitting on wet bedding. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I think about these things just um, with the, like, like roughnecks. It kind of, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a few monitors that come in and out of my brain from time to time. You know, roughnecks have been in there. Uh, yeah. Spinulosis. Um, right. Quince monitors. But I, Species I think that are so secretive they're they're different i mean they're gorgeous right, right? um yeah and so 
like uh, I love the the beak of the roughneck, and I love the neck scales, and um, they're all raised and protruded. Uh, to me, that's really impressive looking. I mean, as far as all the monitor goes, I'd say roughnecks look the most prehistoric still. Yeah, out of, out of everyone. Um, I think one of the big things about roughnecks that I absolutely admire is just the way that you know. When I see her, when I see my female in, in my enclosure, I look at her and I can look into her eyes and she is looking back at me. And I can be like, that is an intelligent animal that has her own, you know, possibly thoughts and feelings about what is going on. And she lets me know how she's feeling. If she's feeling stressed, then she will get kind of huffy and be like, I don't really want to be here right now. Um, but it's, it's more just about, to me, she's interesting because she's uncommon. A lot of people don't understand them very well. Um, I love, you know, her prehistoric look, but I'm mostly interested in her intelligence and how she's alert and how she it's almost like she doesn't act like other monitors. And I know that's kind of, you know, individualistic to say, but she's very unique for her species. Cause I've met a couple other roughnecks, not many, but just enough that I can say that she is extremely comfortable with me. And I, I really enjoy yours that about her kind. species. Yeah. Yours is kind of like one of a kind almost. <laughs> and, and you, you definitely, you definitely get those. There's ones that are kind of just born really nice, almost almost dummy tame you know like nothing phases them really and mm -hmm. so um, yeah that's probably that's probably what you got there and then you carried it on you know you kept on with the positiveness and um you know maybe if this animal wasn't wasn't worked with regularly like the way you are it wouldn't be so nice right now um, i work with her every single day she comes out into my room sometimes um, at least every day I have to handle her. Like that is kind of like my rule unless she's stressed about something, but the likelihood of being her being stressed is not very likely just because my room isn't very stressful environment that I can tell. You know, I don't play loud music. If I'm listening to music, then I have my headphones on. I don't burn things in my room. Um, and I kind of just keep it low key. And I think that she appreciates that, especially for her species being so sensitive to everything, you know. Um, she's not a tree monitor, obviously, with the sensitivity issues, but she's also not like um, like a she's Asian a water monitor there. that doesn't care. <laughs> okay, yeah. That's nice. That's, that's really good. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually glad that um, you're able to come on and share all this with us. Um, I would, maybe we I would can really have happy you, to come on here too. <laughs> well, maybe we can also have you on in the future with uh, your 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 future build. Um, that way we can get an idea of what you're going through. Um, uh, once we get like once you get to the construction part or getting it down to the construction part, we'd love to have you on again if you want to let us know how you're coming along with that. Um, being able to dissect someone's uh, cage build as they're going through it for certain animals is is uh it should be should be good for a lot of the listeners. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, especially with the Southeast Asian species, they aren't very. Um, there's not a lot of resources for building enclosures that are able to contain that high humidity or contain that high heat. And a lot of people tend to make the mistake of, you know, using using mesh wire or something like that to air out their enclosures, but really they're just letting humidity and heat escape. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, my goal is to help educate others um, because I've, I've been in their shoes. I know what it's like to be struggling and be in a position where, you know, it feels like it's all hopeless, but you know, right. there's always a way to maybe get out of it. And um, yeah. you're also young. And like you said, you're kind of unemployed. So things are like at the mercy of when you have money to take care of stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you and me and Alan, we can just kind of blink in our blink our eye. And then two days it'll arrive in Amazon. Um, <laughs> you know, that's because we're kind of lucky that way. But, um, you know, we'll keep on working hard at what you want, what you need to do and um, if monitors are a thing for you, Claire, and 
you'll 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 come back to it. Your heart will take oh, yeah. you back to it. Um, and then as far as new keepers uh, getting into it, you know, if you're really really dedicated as well, it's the same for you. It's like um, try to hang tight on what you got going on, um, and really focus on your animal as as it grows, bond with it, things like that. Try to have it where it's a forever type of pet. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Man. Yeah, we're Thanks, hitting that two hour mark. So Claire, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. And I'm thank you guys for having you me. In the future. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I hope uh, a lot of the young listeners or even just uh, the older beginner listeners will um, benefit from what you came to share with us. Uh, we'll, we'll be gladly um they would have you back on when whenever you're ready with your cage build stuff all right awesome thank you again for having me hey you're welcome thank you for sharing see you later guys bye all right so man that's wrapping it up um what else was there was something floating you know i'll get back to it if not this time the next time but there's so many thoughts coming to my head as we're talking about things all the time but uh, yeah, that wraps it up, man. Let's see. We want to say thank you uh, to all our listeners out there. You guys have been providing great feedback. Yeah, yeah. Been, I, go no, for go it. ahead, man. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you actually have this energy that I don't want to stop. <laughs> it, it started the other night, and I'll, I'll let you continue because it's golden, bro. Yeah, it's just uh, I'm excited that you guys are enjoying it, um, getting something out of it uh you're you're picking up on things for yourself things you've seen uh, don't be afraid if there's something that we're talking about that you've been through too and maybe you got a good idea or a solution uh contact us you know help get those ideas ideas out there too uh we're looking for all of it so we can put it together for all the keepers out there and all the different species um but yeah a lot of good energy a lot of positivity for what we're trying to do and talk about and we're really the idea is just to get this information out to talk about it, spitball a little bit, and um, bring the yeah. we're keeping community together um, for that purpose. You know, share knowledge and, and share in success, the, and learn from each other's failures. So. For the next generation, you know, um, yep. I uh, got to nurture it. I feel like it's just um, getting to the part where we're not, you know, new anymore. So we're kind of like the middle child now, yeah. right? And um, Man, going going from what we're doing now, um, I just want to let everybody know that all your guys' messages and um, comments and shares and tags, uh, it's it does it doesn't go unappreciated at all. Um, we kind of tell ourselves we always we're kind of like kicking ourselves in the foot a little bit, like man, like people are you guys love this and. Um, it, it really just brings a joy to, to me and Alan where uh, we're realizing that even though none of this is scripted, we're just trying to just go with the flow and have people on and really touch the right people. And we're hoping that we're doing right by all you guys, um, you know, just with uh, just with the podcast alone and the information alone. Um, now, I've got a lot of people that have messaged me over the last, uh, I'd say, a couple of weeks and um you'd love to come on or you asked me a bunch of questions right you i promise that we will have another q a session that will be a little bit more in depth on some of the questions that you've asked i know some of them have been really more on the basic beginner type questions but um you know we're we're almost able to help you out with um most of the extensive stuff on a few different species because we've got a few underneath our belt, both Alan and myself. And so we'd be able to help you out. And, you know, I myself normally never would say this, but a lot of monitors are similar into how, how you would approach them as far as, you know, getting into breeding. Because that's what a lot of the questions that you guys have asked me as far as how I breed my Indonesian stuff and what I do and how in depth do I really go into it. Um, and I will, pro I promise I will get to your guys' questions. All right. Good stuff. All right. Again, uh, you can go on to the MoreliaPythonRadio.com website. Check out not only our podcast you can find there, but also all the other podcasts that are under the umbrella. And there's great information. Uh, I love um, carpet pythons. I love Morelia. 
So that's how I got into even even uh, figuring out who they were, where they were as far as NPR uh, and the, the original podcast. So uh, it's exciting to be a part of that now. Um, go on yeah. to their website, look at their their uh, store, look at their Patreon. There's a $5 and a $10 um, choice there if you'd like to support uh, NPR and the NPR network. Um, <clears throat> also, if you're not a U.S. ARC member, there's big things going down just recently. Um, we'd like to thank U.S. ARC. By the time this comes out, um, it'll be a couple weeks. But, you know, they're doing good things. They're protecting your ability to keep animals. And they're, they're winning big fights, uh, not only this year and last year, but over the years they've been fighting for it. So uh, they're, they're almost the only one doing it. So um, really try to reach out and support them if possible. Um, Kai, what do you got to add? Man, not a whole lot. I think we covered a fair amount already. Uh, you know, uh, there's been, um, how do I say this? There's been quite a few, I say people that want to be guests, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love to have you on. We are kind of, uh, uh, not stricken for, I guess, a schedule or something like that being really tight, but it kind of is. Uh, we kind of really want to work around a certain time frame where both of us are sort of free from family life or work or things like that. So um, we try to really pinpoint the very next guest on perfect timing. And yeah. so sometimes it may change on who it is, but, um, you know, um, some of the new guests just uh like let's say you have a bunch of questions right which is great um and we'll have that on for a questionnaire but if you'd love to come on where the conversation is directed or more so of we have a a goal and point that we really want to reach you know mm -hmm. um that's just about that like what you guys are possibly bothered by by the community or something that you know irks you that you really would love the community to see change and grow with um i think that's the part where most people are really uh, we're, we're okay with uncomfortability um, uh, uncomfortableness and stuff like that where some some subjects are a little sour you know and yeah. like um like in this podcast today uh you know we don't want you to be shy so right. some of the things that you learn from or the things that you did and kind of kind of messed up on right um those are key learning points for everybody yeah and even even us ourselves every single time i kill stuff or eggs die or like that's what i'm going through recently right is where i'm not really hatching out some of the eggs and so um i'm asking my friends and i'm asking alan and we're really bouncing back stuff info info back and forth that's what we would love to do with any of you guys so um we can't always answer what you guys are asking within one conversation, but feel free to converse with us, take the time and, you know, just let us know how you're going with a typical conversation. Um, me speeding through information, you'll miss stuff and I don't want to speak information so we can just go through things as questions. And if I can't answer them here, maybe we can just answer them privately and go from there. And that's what I want to leave with uh, any of the people that want to come on. <clears throat> I like it. I like it. Okay. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, that pretty much concludes things. So, uh, you know, I got to, I got to actually have to go back to tending the monitors after this. Some of them are. Yeah. Same. I got to go tend the grasshoppers <laughs> and monitors right after this. The work, the work never ends. Right. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.
天。